opening for quantitative seismic reservoir characterization. So thank you again for joining. Uh, welcome everybody. So let's uh, take, so this will be an overview. We won't go into many of the details. That will be what we'll do in the five-day course. Today is just a 45-minute overview of some of the things that we will learn, some of the things that we have to be careful about, some opportunities that we have in combining machine learning with rock physics, but also the pitfalls of uh, how to do that and uh, what we should be careful about. So here's an example of a, a result of a quantitative seismic interpretation workflow where the seismic data along with uh, well logs, geology, rock physics models have been used to come up with an interpretation. <clears throat> and what you see there are not uh, geobodies of uh, your reservoir bodies, but those are isoprality maps. So those are locations where it is highly probable that we have a uh, good reservoir. So that's in quantitative seismic interpretation, we have to give not only just the deterministic uh, interpretation, but we have to also give the probability of that interpretation. What is the probability? You have to quantify the uncertainty of that interpretation. So that's very important. That, that's what makes it quantitative. So let's look at this example. This is from NOTC. And so, so here, this is a horizon uh, map. So we are looking down from the top and, and, and we have some colors. The colors there indicate seismic reflection amplitude. So seismic waves are, are sound waves that go down into the earth and they get reflected back. So they're echoes reflected back from the uh, subsurface. And we see different strength of the echo, the amplitude of the reflected waves are different. So if you look at the shape, uh, any geologist would be able to identify that this is a, a turbidite system, a submarine turbidite system. So you have the channel over here, channel coming in from this direction on this side, and then you have um, the fans, the lobes. So that's all good, but why do we have different amplitudes as shown by the colors, right? So we have uh, blue colors as a low amplitude and the yellow and red, those are high amplitudes. Uh, what do those mean and what controls those amplitudes? So uh, also when we have high amplitudes in the channel, uh, does that high amplitude correspond to good sands? And the interpretation on the channel side, can it also be applied on the lobes? Uh, so uh, it turns out that that's not, uh, that's not the right interpretation. So what controls these amplitudes? Well, there are many different things. Uh, there's of course lithology, the rock type itself, shale versus sand. So outside the channel, we have lots of shale. So that's a different amplitude, but within the channel, we have uh, good sands. So that gives rise to a different amplitude, but also other factors such as porosity, Pore fluid, what kind of fluids do you have here? Is it, uh, is it brine saturated sand or is it a uh, gas saturated sand? And then uh, the geologic processes, processes of sedimentation, sorting, diagenesis, all of those can impact these amplitudes. Here's another one. This is uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> from Saudi Arabia. And here we see uh, different amplitudes. Again, this is a map. This is a, a map. We're looking at the map and we are looking at different amplitudes. The reds and the blues, the, they indicate different amplitudes. And here it was interpreted to be the reds cor corresponds to uh, oil saturation while the blues are water saturation. So this was a water flood. And we can see how the water comes in. This is the blue. And the water comes in and flows along these major faults and fractures. And so if you have uh, this kind of interpretation, it is very important because then we can figure out where the water is flowing and we can optimize the water flooding. For example, there might be places where uh, there's bypassed oil. So again, how do we then relate these amplitudes back to saturation and reservoir heterogeneity, where the faults are located, where, where there's variations in uh, porosity and hence permeability. Another example of uh, seismic signatures of pore fluids. So here we see when we have water saturated uh, reservoir and oil and gas saturated reservoir, it gives rise to different seismic amplitudes. So how do we interpret that? How do you understand that? This one is uh, much shallower. It's from a near surface geophysics uh, survey. Again, we are looking at amplitudes. So this is uh, a map view. And we can see that we have different amplitudes. Right? So you have 
uh, in blue, we have some uh, lower amplitudes over here. Uh, so we can see these amplitudes and we can identify from the shape that that looks like a buried stream channel. So that's good. Uh, it's a buried stream channel. But then the question is, uh, is that um, buried stream channel, is it um, sand rich or is it clay rich? Right? So is it a good reservoir? Is it completely clay filled uh, channel? And uh, if it is a good sand rich uh, uh, channel, then what are the fluids there? Is it filled with oil? Is it filled with gas? What kind of fluids do we have there? So how do we take these seismic amplitudes and then combine that with rock physics and make interpretations about rock types, pore fluids, uh, diagenesis, sorting, and so forth, cementation, geologic processes. Now, the seismic velocity depends on pore fluids, like we uh, saw some examples there, but the relation between velocity and saturation is not unique. So here we see we have velocity on the on this axis, axis, uh, y axis, and here we have saturation, saturation fraction. So what fraction of the pore space is filled with water, SW? So on this side we have 100% water saturated, and here uh, we have uh, dry. But now we see so as saturation changes, we see that velocity changes, but we have uh, a non-unique um, relation. It also depends on the saturation scales. So if the saturation is at what is called a fine scale, fine scale, poor scale mixing, then we have one relation shown by the open circles. But if it is a coarse scale mixing, then we have a different relation shown by the uh, closed circles, the black dots. And this depends on the process, whether it's an imbibition process or a drainage process, which way are we going? Are we increasing the water saturation or are we are draining away the water? So as you can see, this can give rise to uh, uh, non-uniqueness in our interpretation. Let's say we observe a particular velocity. Say we observe this velocity, or also we might observe an impedance, which is velocity times the density. Now, depending on the saturation, so we want to interpret that velocity in terms of saturation. Well, it could be if it is coarse scale patchy saturation, it might be 65% saturation or if it is a fine scale saturation, it might be 85% saturation. So we need to know uh, when we have to uh, model it using a coarse scale patchy saturation and when we have to model it using a fine scale saturation. And that will depend on the processes in the reservoir, imbibition process, drainage process, the different pore fluids that are there that are mixed together. And so that will help us to reduce the ambiguity of the interpretation. Time-lapse seismic, this is important not only for oil and gas, but also it is very important for CO2 sequestration, for monitoring CO2 sequestration. These days, as you know, we, we have to sequester CO2 in, in reservoirs as well as uh, saline aquifers. And so as we inject the CO2 inside, we need to understand where the CO2 plume is migrating. Is it safely within the, the, uh, the storage site or, or are the chances for leaking? So time-lapse seismic is one, uh, one of the tools for monitoring uh, subsurface fluid flow, whether it's oil and gas, uh, steam injection, or, or CO2 injection. <clears throat> Here also, we see that uh, the time-lapse seismic amplitudes depend on the rock properties, the fluid properties, porosity, as well as the scale of saturation. So this uh, example here is a slide where we see change in amplitudes. So this is a delta. RMS change, so root mean square change in amplitude over a certain time. And you see there's a lot of change here. And so this was a place where they were injecting uh, gas to drive up the oil towards a, a producer. But if you do the interpretation without, without accounting for the saturation scales, then our interpretation can be uh, completely off. So that is shown here on this plot. So here we have the change in amplitude on the near offset and the mid offset. And if we do not account for the scales of saturation, we'll get some uh, model that predicts uh, values over here with some uncertainty, while the observations from the field data are way over here, so completely off. However, if we correctly understand the scales of saturation, downscale the saturation and increase the patchiness, then we can get our models, which are consistent with the data, the field data, and then we can do a better prediction. So uh, se seismic signatures depend on rock and fluid properties, saturation, and scales of saturation.
Another very important area where we use seismic data to make subsurface uh, interpretations, that is uh, fractures. Fractures uh, can have a variety of seismic signatures, and it, it depends on the lithology, what kind of rock we have, where the fractures are, are there, the fracture orientation, the number of uh, sets of fractures, as well as what is inside the fracture compared to what is inside the matrix of the rock. And why are fractures so important? Well, fractures are important for multiple reasons. Fractures can be conduits for flow, so they can they can guide the fluid flow. And so if you're doing uh, water flooding or, or some, something like that, it might be thief zones because uh, the fluid flows through the fracture and doesn't actually give good sweep. Uh, the sweep efficiency can decrease. On the other hand, fractures can also be very good because if you have a very tight reservoir, it is the fractures that are contributing the, to the fluid flow. So it's very important to understand fractures. We want to understand um, the intensity of fracturing, whether it is uh, highly fractured or not so fractured, as well as the orientation of the fractures. And then what is inside? So we, we study fractures in the field from outcrop and geologic studies. We study fractures in the lab, looking at a uh, lab scale, as well as from the seismic data. So here is an example where we're looking at amplitudes for uh, different kind of fractures with different fluids inside the fractures. So water saturated cracks versus gas saturated cracks. And let me explain what these uh, colorful uh, figures are. So these uh, colors indicate reflection amplitude. And what the, uh, this diagram is, this polar diagram, is reflection amplitude as a function of angle of reflection, so angle of inc incidence and reflection, as well as azimuth with respect to the fracture orientation. So here on this side, we see the azimuth. So going from zero to 360 degree with respect to the fracture orientation. And as we go from the center out, we see uh, angle. So at the center is normal incidence reflection. So wave goes down, comes back up, right? So that's zero degree. And then as we go from uh, out outward from the center, we have zero degree, then uh, 10 degree, 20 degree, and so on. So that is um, AVO. So we have AVO, amplitude versus offset or angle, as well as amplitude versus azimuth. So AVO and AV, AVAZ, if you want to call that uh, uh, amplitude versus azimuth. Both of those are shown here. And so here you can see how the amplitude varies. So this is at a particular offset at 35 degree. We look at all azimuths and you can see how the amplitude varies with azimuth when the fractures or cracks are water saturated. However, if we replace that water with gas, you have a different AVO and AVOZ behavior. Right? So this one has a different behavior, smaller uh, azimuthal variation compared to water saturated. And this depends on not only what is inside the fractures, it also depends on the matrix properties. Where are the fractures situated? So it depends on the matrix properties. Sometimes, depending on the matrix and the fractures, this might be inverted. Maybe when you have gas, you might have a larger azimuthal variation and less with water. It depends also on the matrix properties because uh, it's a combination of not only what is in the fracture, but also what is in the matrix. So you have to be careful again um, uh, when you do these kind of interpretations. Sometimes you might be pitfall because water saturated fracture in the cap rock might resemble gas saturated fracture in the reservoir. So you have to do the forward modeling, rock physics modeling, uh, to uh, model this anisotropy as a function of azimuth as well as uh, uh, the incidence angle. Again, here the colors are the P2P reflectivity as a function of azimuth as well as um, offset or angle of reflection. So in rock physics, what is, what is rock physics? Uh, what do we learn when we, uh, when we study rock physics? So the purpose of rock physics is to discover and understand relations between seismic attributes or more generally geophysical attributes and rock and fluid properties. So for seismic attributes, what seismic attributes? Maybe velocity, impedance. Impedance, we might get that from uh, impedance inversions, reflectivity, AVO, amplitude versus offset, amplitude versus azimuth, sometimes also wave attenuation, all of these attributes. If you're also looking at uh, other Geophysical uh, measurements such as electromagnetic or, or resistivity, we might be looking at uh, a resistivity, of course, or, or EM uh, attributes. And we want to link them 
to rock and fluid properties. Ultimately, we're in interested in the rock properties. Rock type, of course, uh, is it a good uh, reservoir uh, or is it shale? Uh, what kind of reservoir? Is it uh, clean sand, cemented sand, shaley sand? And the porosity, of course. Uh, porosity is a key property that we look for, whether we are producing or we are storing. All of those require understanding the porosity. And the pore fluids, what, what is inside there? Where is the uh, oil and gas? Where is the CO2 plume migrating? So pore fluids and saturation, as well as uh, pore pressure, temperature, conditions. So rock and fluid properties, how are they related to our geophysical measurements, seismic measurements or, or electrical measurements. And why do we want to understand the relation? Of course, it is uh, from an acad academic point of view, that might be very interesting. But uh, more practically, by understanding that, we can quantify our geophysical interpretation, seismic interpretation or, or electromagnetic interpretation. We can understand the links between the geology and, and our geophysical measurements, and we can make smarter extrapolations and quantify uncertainty. So what does that mean, making smarter extrapolations? So in you know, when we do this kind of analysis, we have some wells, we have well logs, we, we might also have cores. So at the well location, we have a lot of information. We know a lot about the rocks at the well location from the different sophisticated logs that we might have, um, uh, sonic logs, electrical logs, uh, radioactive logs, gamma ray logs, and so and, and many others, also cores. So uh, our, our borehole imaging logs. But the problem is nature, geology is very heterogeneous. We may know a lot about the rock and the, and the subsurface at the well location, but how do we go and make interpretations away from the well location? The problem is, is the heterogeneity. If it had been a perfect, nice layer cake geology, then we could just take the well interpretation and just extrapolate uh, along the layers, but that's not the case. Uh, they're very heterogeneous. And so making extrapolations away from the well, we have to use data that we have away from the well, which is of course the indirect remotely sensed data such as seismic measurements or, or electric, electrical measurements. And how do we make the extrapolation then? We have to then link our seismic attributes to the rock and fluid properties. And so by understanding the, the relation using rock physics, then we can quantify the uncertainty and then we can minimize our interpretation risk. And then that will help to make better decisions, whether it is for developing the resource uh, or it is for storage. So whether it is uh, producing oil and gas or for groundwater, or it is storing CO2 and, and other, other uh, uh, things in the subsurface. So often you'll hear different terms, <clears throat> rock physics, petrophysics, rock mechanics. Of course, there's a lot of overlap. Fundamentals are, are similar fundamental continuum mechanics, elasticity theory, and so forth, physics. But there are also some differences. So as, as I just mentioned, in rock physics, we want to understand the relation between geophysical measurement and rock properties. And often, the emphasis is on seismic data, because that's uh, the best quality data we have, high resolution, also spatially exhaustive. Um, so emphasis on interpreting seismic data, understanding the sonic log, from well logs and in the lab, we use ultrasonic measurements. Of course, we also have rock physics for, uh, for electrical properties also. In petrophysics, it is focused on interpretation of well logs for formation evaluation. So it is traditionally mostly limited at the wells. It is similar to rock physics. So there is emphasis on well logs, but often traditional petrophysics was focused more on the electrical logs and radioactive logs, ignoring the sonic logs and seismic logs, traditionally. So it is more at the well scale. However, of course, we need to have good petrophysics, good quality logs to be able to do rock physics. Without good petrophysics, without uh, uh, quality controlled well logs, sonic logs and other logs, we cannot do rock physics. We cannot calibrate our rock physics model. So petrophysics, interpretation of logs for formation evaluation, mostly focused at the well scale. Uh, however, that's an important input to make our rock physics models and understand what is happening away from the well uh, based on the seismic data. Then we have also rock mechanics, uh, geomechanics. Here, the emphasis on uh, stress and deformation, how the rocks are breaking under stress, faulting fracture processes and so forth, uh, whether it is natural fractures or, or 
uh, human made fractures. Uh, so we, we sometimes induce fractures to increase the productivity of the wells and so forth. So that's rock mechanics and geomechanics. Again, there are uh, fundamental uh, things which are similar, continuum mechanics, elasticity theory, stress strain, and so forth, those are related. Uh, so rock mechanics emphasis on, on a kind of large scale stress, faulting and fracturing. In rock physics, we are looking at wave propagation. So the, uh, the stress magnitudes are usually much, much smaller when you have a propagating wave. So the rock physics link then, we have seismic data and conventional interpretation is the interpretation of geometries. We look at horizons, we look at faults and so forth, and we come up with the geologic interpretation of the architecture of the reservoir. But then in rock physics, we also want to go beyond just that conventional geometric interpretation. And we want to understand amplitudes and, and uh, amplitude variation with offset and so forth, combined with the rock physics models and give a quantitative interpretation of the rock properties. So when we have this, in this uh, diagram, we have some uh, yellows and blues. So what kind of rock is it? Is, there, is that a shale? Is that a good cap rock over there? Is this blue? Is that a, uh, is that a different shale? Maybe this one is a, a reservoir with oil and so forth. So it's a quantitative interpretation of physical rock properties, lithologies, and pore fluids. So that's a rock physics link that links our seismic data combined with geologic interpretation, but interprets that in terms of the actual properties of, of uh, 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 rocks and fluids. And here is an example of velocity versus porosity. And here are some, some examples of different models that we'll look at in more detail in our, in our course. So here we have a friable sand model or unconsolidated sand model that is shown by this trend here. And then this one is a cemented sand model with a, uh, with a quartz cement. And also you can see how we, as we change the cement, we have different trends depending on the quartz cementation or clay cementation. So we find these transforms and then apply them to different uh, uh, seismic attributes that we have interpreted or derived. So here's an example from, um, I, I believe this is from Colombia. So we have, this is again a map view. We have reflection amplitudes that is then that goes through an impedance inversion and we see uh, different values of impedances and we see some shapes. So now we have to interpret that in terms of rock properties. So in this particular case, so this is from the last Sierra field in Colombia, there is a relation between impedance and porosity. So the high porosity sands in general have a lower impedance in this field and the low uh, porosity uh, non-reservoirs, so the shales have a higher impedance. Of course, there is also some overlap. So there is some uncertainty, you can see that. However, once we have this uh, transform, impedance to porosity transform, then we can interpret our impedance inversion in terms of uh, the geology. So here we have meandering sand channels, shales, or here we have braided sand channels and so forth. Then of course, we have to make sure that it's consistent with the geology. So stratigraphy and geology are paramount and uh, they should be used to make sure that the seismic and rock physics interpretations are consistent with our, with our understanding of the geologic environment of that subsurface, the depositional environment and so forth. Another example from offshore Brazil, this is a campus basin, one of the prolific basins. And here we have amplitude. So uh, this is a, a vertical section, a 2D section. And we see this bright amplitudes in the seismic data. So what causes this bright amplitudes? Are they related to uh, oil? And can we discriminate between heavy oil and light oil? So bright amplitudes cause, could be caused by many different things. Uh, rock and fluid property contrast, lithology, but also uh, fluid properties. A different example, which will go in more detail in, in the course, but here just a, a preview. Uh, so this is from North Sea, Norwegian North Sea. So here we see the, the coast. This is Norway over here. This is offshore. And we have this uh, Graben, the Viking Graben, and the two fields, Grana and Glitna. And here we have two wells, well one and well two. <clears throat> it's a turbidite system. So here we are seeing the actual field data. So that's shown on the left here, the field gather. Uh, so this is, uh, so we have AVO, uh, amplitude versus offset. The red line here is the top of the reservoir, top Heimdall, so that's what we're interested in. So well one, well two, the field gathers as well as the synthetic gathers, computed, so that's the synthetic and the uh, actual field gathers. And what we see here on this plot here is uh, angle or offset, 
versus uh, P2P reflection amplitude. And we can see the dots, the black dots are the ones from the field gather. You can see those uh, pitch amplitudes and the red curve is a theoretical one. So it has been calibrated. And so these two wells, they're both the same fluid. The, the reservoir there both have oil. However, in well two, it is slightly more cemented. So it is a, a slightly more cemented. This, uh, the sand there is slightly more cemented, a little bit more cement. And what we see here is the change in AVO, right? So as we uh, increase cementation, we go from unconsolidated to cemented sand, no change in pore fluid. We go from here to here, right? So this moves up there. Now, of course, the cementation is at the pore scale. The, pore, uh, the cement is at the grain to grain contacts, which is making the rock stiffer. So obviously the seismic waves do not resolve the cement, but it is the overall effective property of the rock that gives rise to a change in the seismic signature. And that seismic signature or the change in the seismic signature can then be used to interpret what kind of rock we have, whether it is unconsolidated, cemented, and also what kind of fluid we have inside that rock. So we can use those kind of understanding to interpret uh, AVO. So here is a, it's a horizon, the top of that Heimdall, and we have zero offset reflectivity. So R, R0, you can see where we have relatively high R0 and then relatively low R0, and we can also get the gradient. So this is obtained from uh, pre-stack analysis, AVO analysis of the gathers over the whole horizon, not just at the well location, but away from the well. So we, we calibrate and understand our models at the well, but then we go over the whole horizon. So combining this AVO, R0, and G gradient, then we can do analysis. We can understand the variability of the response. We, can, we have to do Monte Carlo simulations. And when we do the Monte Carlo simulations, we have to take into account the different correlations between the rock properties, VP and VS correlations and so forth. And so then, uh, why do we need to understand the variability? Because it is not just a single response. This one here, we did a deterministic analysis to calibrate our rock physics model. But in reality, of course, we see that there's a variability in that response. It's not just a single line. So we have to understand that variability using Monte Carlo simulations. And uh, because of the variability, there can be overlap or ambiguity in the interpretation. And so combining that together, then you can come up with a uh, 3D uh, lithophaceous prediction where we have high probability of oil sand. So now we uh, do not want to give a deterministic result because there's ambiguity, there's uh, overlap in the interpretation. So this is high probability. Most likely there's an oil sand here. Most likely these are shales. And here we have interpreted sand shales and so forth. Another example, again from the North Sea, but instead of uh, doing AVO, we can also do impedance inversion. We can do partial stack, impedance inversion, near offset stack, part offset stack. We can do those uh, impedance inversions and we can get different attributes such as uh, the uh, acoustic impedance, which is uh, velocity times density and the far offset impedance, sometimes also called elastic impedance. Or we might also get acoustic impedance and VPVS ratio, uh, different depending on the kind of inversion you're doing. Sometimes you might be able to get uh, P wave impedance and shear wave impedance. So either way, we have uh, two different attributes, uh, near and far offset impedance cubes derived from uh, seismic inversion. And then we also, of course, have our uh, well logs. And we, uh, along with the well logs and understanding of the geology, we calibrate our rock physics models. So we do this on one side. We have our seismic inversions. Of course, this is also guided by, by uh, calibrating to the well log. Then with our Monte Carlo simulations, we have our probability distributions for the probability distribution of the seismic attributes for the different categories such as, for example, the shales, the oil sand, brine sand, and so forth. And combining them, all of them together, we come up with an integrated uh, interpretation of the facies probabilities. Where do we have high probability of oil sand? Where do we have high probability of uh, brine sand and so forth? So then once we have that full workflow, then we can come up with probability maps. These examples are for depth average probability maps. So we are averaging over that reservoir interval. And we can see where we have high probability of oil sand, other places where we have brine sand and so forth. And then we can come up with a full uh, characterization. As I mentioned when I started, so these 
again, are not geobodies, they're not deterministic geobodies, but isoprality surfaces showing most likely or high priority values of, of oil sand and so forth. 80% or 85% chance of getting oil sand. So again, that's our rock physics link. We have seismic data and we want to interpret that not only in terms of geometries, which is the conventional traditional interpretation, we want to interpret that in terms of rock properties and fluid properties. So, but if we look at rocks, they are very complex. This is a thin section. It is, you see the scale here, 500 microns, and you can see some grains and the blue here is, is the pore space. So the pore space is filled with epoxy before we make the thin section. So we see the uh, pore, uh, pore space, it's very complex. The, uh, the, the grains, they are different shapes and sizes. They are different minerals. You can see quartz, feldspars, micas, and so forth. So how do we model this mathematically? How do we uh, do any kind of uh, quantitative equations with this? It's so complex. Uh, so there are traditionally, there are two types of models or, or a large class of models called effective medium models. And what we do there is we say that, well, Yes, it is indeed very complex at the pore scale. Uh, there are different shapes and sizes and so forth. But what we really want to understand is the effective elastic properties. Elastic properties because we're interested in seismic, let's say. So we want to uh, understand the effective elastic properties. Could also be effective electrical properties if you're interested in, in electrical uh, geophysical measurements. So we don't want to model each and every grain in its detail but we want to understand overall what's the effective bulk modulus, what's the effective shear modulus, and then uh, with those we can compute VP, VS, and density. So there are two classes of effective medium models, traditional effective medium models. One, on one side we have contact theory models or also sometimes called granular media models. And the other class is a inclusion models. And so what does that, uh, what do we do there? So in contact theory model, we'll say, all right, so this is too complex. We cannot do any mathematics with that, uh, uh, analytical mathematics at least. So let's try to simplify. And let's imagine that the grains, instead of this complicated shapes, let's imagine that each grain is a sphere. So each grain is a sphere and we have a contact between the sphere. So if you have a contact, a single contact and there's spherical grains, then we can do mathematics and clever uh, mathematicians and, and theoreticians have solved that problem of two spherical grains in contact. So we have idealized the geometry. Instead of the complex uh, sh uh, shape, we have idealized the geometry and we, we can solve analytically the deformation or the elastic properties of a single contact between two spheres. But that's not the whole problem. The rock is not just two grains in contact. We have so many other uh, grains in contact there. So then we also have to do some sort of an averaging to account for the multiple contacts, so the multiple body interaction. So that's again done. So there's again an approximation to account for multiple contacts. So what have we done? We have idealized the geometry, but by idealizing the geometry, we can do some mathematics, we can get uh, some equations, and then we have approximated the multiple interactions together. So that gives us one class of models called contact theory models, granular media models. And these are uh, <clears throat> good for higher porosity on the high porosity side. On the other side, uh, we start on the other end from the low porosity end and we might say, well, let's imagine that the rock is completely made up of a pure matrix, the quartz matrix. And instead of uh, trying to model the shape of the pores, very complex shapes, you see the blue, it's very complex. Let's imagine that the pores are ellipsoidal inclusions. So that's an inclusion. Uh, why ellipsoid? Ellipsoid because once uh, we have we have idealized the shape into an ellipsoid, we can solve or people have solved for the complete deformation of a single ellipsoid in an infinite medium, and that's a, a very famous solution called the SLB solution. But of course, that's not the whole story. It's not just a single pore. So again, we have to. Uh, do an approximation, multiple body approximation for the multiple pores sitting in that in, in that uh, matrix. So that's the inclusion models, and those are also very useful, and they are uh, very appropriate at the low porosity end member. And we'll see what are the how we use them, what are the approximations, what are the limitations of these kind of effective medium models, contact theory models, and inclusion models. <clears throat> 
So in both cases, we are idealizing the geometry, but by idealizing the geometry, we can do some mathematics, and then we are also <coughs> approximating the multiple body interactions. But these days, we also have digital rock physics or computational rock physics, where we can go away from that idealization of the geometry and we can actually try to model numerically, computationally, the complex geometry. So we can image using high resolution CT scan, high resolution, high resolution SEMs and so forth, focused ion beam uh, uh, SEM and so on. We can image the complex geometry and then we can compute the properties using numerical methods, lattice Boltzmann simulations, finite element, finite differences, different type of uh, simulations. We can simulate uh, the rock, rock properties, elastic properties, electrical properties, fluid flow and so forth on the same uh, digital uh, image of the rock. This of course also comes with own challenges. Imaging the rock has issues. There might be artifacts in imaging, the limitations of resolution if you do not have uh, high quality, re high resolution, you might be missing some parts of the pore space. And then of course, numerical simulation requires algorithms and, and codes that might require high powered uh, computation to run. And it, it may be computationally much more intensive than our traditional effective medium models. But these days, there's a lot of work going on on computational rock physics or digital rock physics. Then uh, a very uh, uh, important problem that we learn in rock physics that we learn in our course is seismic fluid substitution, how pore fluids and pore stiffness, the stiffness of the pore, how they interact together to give rise to the seismic signatures. So this is a very important problem, kind of the bread and butter of rock physics. Here, the problem is we want to analyze how the rock properties and ultimately the seismic uh, uh, behavior changes when the pore fluids are changed. Is there something on the chat? <clears throat> mm. Okay. All right, so how does uh, uh, how does the seismic signature change when we change pore fluids? And this can be in multiple cases. For example, if you're flooding a sandy interval with brine. And so initially this interval was, uh, uh, initially it was oil and then the uh, we are uh, water flooding it. So the water replaces the oil. So what happens to the P wave uh, uh, the uh, P wave, S wave, and density properties, and ultimately what happens to the seismic signature? How does that change? So that might be uh, during a time lapse. But we also want to change, we might also want to have the same question laterally away from the well. Yeah, so we might be interested in how the seismic will change if the fluid changes either over time at the same position or as we move laterally away from the well and, and encounter a different fluid in, the, in that reservoir. So it might be 4D changes, or it might be lateral changes, right? So if we if we have a well in the in the wet zone, can we predict the signature of oil zone? And if we can predict the signature of oil zone, then we can use that to try to interpret our seismic to find where we might have oil sand and so forth. Similarly, also for uh, 4D, whether it is for oil fields or for CO2 uh, sequestration, can we predict the uh, saturation change as the CO2 plume moves through the storage uh, area? Then we also want to understand the rock, rock physics links with the geologic processes. What happens when we have uh, diagenesis sedimentation? What happens when we have different types of sorting? So we want to link velocity with geologic processes of sorting and cementation. So here's a life story of a clastic sediment. So on this plot, we have velocity and porosity. And, and these are two theoretical curves. These are bounds. So we start when, uh, when in a classic sediment, initially uh, the sediments are in the, in the streams and rivers as they're flowing. And so it's transported, sediment transport. So it's all mostly water and a few grains of sediment are being transported. So very high porosity. And ultimately it starts to get deposited. And the grains settle down, the grains settle down and they uh, fall on the river bed or lake bed. And so that's a deposition. So still it's very high porosity. It's very loose, very, very mushy, just at the bottom of the lake or, or river. So that's the deposition. Then if you have well-sorted deposition, <clears throat> then uh, we have uh, a porosity of say, let's say around 40% for, for sands, it's well-sorted. But if you have poorly sorted, then you have poor sorting means you have some large grains and some small grains. 
And so if they are mixed together, so the small grains will fill up the pore space of the large grains. And so that will give you lower porosity. So, so they're deposited at, at about the same time, but we have well-sorted uh, sediments, higher porosity, poorly sorted sediments, lower porosity. And what happens after that? So after they're deposited, they start to get buried. So now it is no longer very soft. It starts compacting. And so it moves away from that lower bound and it starts compacting. So you have those trends and there's a compaction trend. And ultimately there's diagenesis, so uh, mechanical, then followed uh, by chemical diagenesis where you have cementation and so forth. And so that's a trend over there. So how do we understand this trend of sorting and diagenesis? And what are the models that we can use to model these kind of geologic processes? And once we understand these uh, trends, we can then use that to extrapolate. So let's say here we have, in, in, we have some seismic data, we have some wells, and that is uh, uh, going to certain depth. But now we want to extrapolate. Maybe you want to understand the properties deeper. What kind of model do we use to uh, interpolate, uh, extrapolate beyond that depth? Maybe you want to go towards the deep water. What kind of model should we use to extrapolate away from the well towards the basin? So how, uh, what are the rock physics changes as we go away from the basin or we go deeper and then maybe from one basin to the other basin? So there's a depositional trend and then we have the diagenetic trend as we go deeper. Now, of course, these days, <clears throat> there's a, a lot of uh, you know, uh, activity in machine learning and, and AI. So what are how can we use machine learning along with rock physics? What are the opportunities? What are some of the pitfalls? So we'll be looking, we'll be going to that more in the course, but here are some highlights, some overviews. So application, there are many different applications of machine learning. Uh, classification, for example, we want to classify given seismic data, we want to classify it into say good reservoir, bad reservoir, uh, cap rock and so forth. So that's a classification problem. We want to do unsupervised clustering, of course, nonlinear and linear regressions, data analytics, there are many different machine learning applications that we can borrow from other fields such as in your computer science and, and so forth. And we can apply that in our rock physics. And in, in a certain sense, <clears throat> sense we have been using uh, traditional machine learning over, over the years, over the decades. So empirical database regression models such as Hans uh, relations and Everhard Phillips relations, those are all data-based models. So those are empirical re regression models, which, which are traditional machine learning, Bayesian classification, artificial neural networks for lithology and fluid prediction. We have been using that from the 1990s. So many years of uh, traditional machine learning, kernel-based methods for uh, sub-resolutions, Shelley Sands, and these days, uh, more uh, more recently, we are using what are called deep learning methods. Deep learning uh, methods <clears throat> using uh, uh, convolution neural networks as well as uh, 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 other kind of networks for seismic inversion and reservoir characterization. So, why are are we interested in machine learning? What has changed? So, uh, there's been a fundamental change in the way computations are done and it's been driven by many different factors. One of them being the gaming industry. The gaming industry is a you know, $100 billion industry. And because of that, it has driven the growth of GPUs, uh, graphic processing units. And because of GPU, machine learning speed has increased many times, 500 times boost in, in deep learning. Uh, if you had only CPUs, you can see that's a CPU, here's a CPU curve, but with GPUs, which is driven partly by games and so forth, but nowadays with machine learning, this has boosted uh, uh, speed for, for deep learning and that has created a phase transformation in how machine learning, special deep learning is done, which was not possible uh, 10 years ago. And so there's a phase transition in this massive computation and is changing the way that science and scientific research is done using uh, Monte Carlo simulation and a large scale uh, simulations. So with those kind of things we can use, for example, we can take seismic gathers, uh, angle gathers, uh, schematically years, zero degree, 30 degree, and we can use this deep uh, machines, deep networks. In this case, it's a CNN, multi-layer CNN with different uh, architectures going from 64 down to a fully connected layer. And the output then is a prediction of porosity and weak layer. So how do we do that? Of course, we need to train. We need to train the deep network using uh, training data. It requires uh, 
Deep learning requires a lot of data. That's one of the challenges. But here's an example of uh, once a deep network is trained, we can go through the seismic queue very rapidly. After training, the inference is very fast, and we can come up with these kind of interpretations of, uh, so let's say in this, uh, in this case, it's a petrophysical interpretation of weak clay, porosity, and so on. So it requires a lot of training data. And so if you're doing supervised machine learning, then it requires what is called as label data. So we have to have pairs. When we train this network, we need to have pairs of seismic traces and the corresponding petrophysical traces. And we need a lot of that, thousands of that. Deep learning requires a lot of training data. So how do we do that? Uh, we don't have, in, in seismic uh, situations, we don't have well logs at every seismic trace. So we don't have that pair, paired label data. So we need to use our domain knowledge, geology and rock physics to augment the training data and to give that to the for the training. So uh, how do we augment that? How do we make sure that it's properly augmented and it's not biased? All of those are the pitfalls of things that have to be careful about when we use deep learning and machine learning. But once we do that, uh, combining our domain knowledge and rock physics with modern machine learning, that can lead to better predictions and hopefully that better predictions will lead to better decisions. So there are supervised and unsupervised deep learning. There are pros and cons of each kind of uh, uh, machine learning. And then of course, physics informed. What are the pros and cons of those? Are we incorporating the right physics in the physics informed network? And how do we incorporate that? So machine learning and rock physics, there are of course opportunities with modern computation, but also there are pitfalls you have to be careful about. And of course, it's a multidisciplinary. This whole uh, thing is multidisciplinary. It's not just one thing. It's not a silver bullet that will solve all problems. We use uh, digital rock physics, computational rock physics, along with machine learning. But also, we have to understand our geology and put our models in the right context to come up with an integrated interpretation. And so it's all integrated together, uh, combining statistical rock physics and machine learning to give not only the most likely interpretation, but also quantifying the uncertainty. That's very important. Because ultimately, we, we do this not just to create pretty pictures, but to inform some decisions. Somebody has to make a decision. And to make the decision, we also need to understand our uncertainty, because then that will help us to understand the risks involved. So rock physics is a bridge between geology and geophysics. Uh, it's also a bottleneck, because we have few observables, and we want to understand many different things about the geology. So there are ambiguities variability and, and uncertainties and pitfalls. As the goals of the course then will be to synthesize and generalize the current state of the art, provide some recipes, recommendations, and then uh, pitfalls as well. So what are the assumptions? What are the pitfalls? And that's, uh, we'll be looking at all of those. And so this was a highlight and overview of the many different things we'll be looking, uh, going through in more, much more detail in the course. And so here are some of the Text that we'll be drawing from, of course, the Rock Physics Handbook, Quantitative Seismic Interpretation, and, and so on. Some texts as well as some uh, papers and, and uh, reprint series, which are collections of papers that are very useful for, for these uh, courses. So I'll stop there. Uh